Hello everyone and welcome to our video about factors affecting photosynthesis. This is again one of our videos from our module 5 series about photosynthesis and what we're going to be looking at in this video is the section 5.2.1 G and these are the factors that affect photosynthesis looking at some of those key limiting factors and basically what they do in terms of the concentrations of certain products that we've looked at. First thing then is, if we think back to GCSE biology, we will have been told about these things called limiting factors. Now, a limiting factor quite simply is one that will determine the rate when it occurs at a lower level. So what we find is that we've got a number of factors that could be limiting factors of photosynthesis. And what we're gonna do is take each one in turn to see what happens. First up then is a temperature. Now, when we consider temperature, the first thing to remember as far as temperature affecting photosynthesis is that photosynthesis is an enzyme controlled reaction. If it is an enzyme controlled reaction, what we should hopefully realize is this little graph should be highly familiar to us because it's the same shape as any enzyme controlled reaction being affected by temperature. So let's explain this little graph then. First of all, when we increase the temperature, and usually this is up to 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, then the rate will increase. Now that does make this big assumption that there are no other factors limiting the rate. If it is purely temperature that is the limiting factor, increase in temperature increases the rate of photosynthesis up to around about 25 to 30 usually. So what we actually find is we have this relationship called the Q10 relationship. And again, this should be familiar to us. And the initial part of our little graph actually follows this Q10 relationship. Now, you would have probably been told that Q10 equals 2 is a great example there. And what we mean by that is that when the temperature increases by 10 degrees Celsius, then the rate is going to double, hence Q10 equals 2. The way that we actually calculate our Q10 is our rate at the higher temperature, hence R2, divided by the rate at the lower temperature. So all we do is we'd have a look on our graph. We'd obviously read a particular temperature if it tells us to read a particular temperature. Otherwise, just pick two 10 degrees apart and then you can divide higher temperature by the lower temperature rate. If the temperature then exceeds 30 degrees Celsius, then what we tend to see, or at least with most plants, is we get this reduced growth rate. And this is all down to photorespiration. So what we actually find is that the oxygen is actually going to be competing with carbon dioxide for the active site of Rubisco. Now, hopefully we remember Rubisco from the previous video where we were looking at the light independent stage. Rubisco, remember, is the enzyme involved in allowing the RUBP to combine with the carbon dioxide to form RGP. So if the oxygen is competing with that carbon dioxide for the active site of Rubisco, then what we're going to find is there's less carbon dioxide able to combine with the active site. Therefore, less GP is going to be produced. If we make less GP, we can form less TP. The lack of TP means the RUBP is not regenerated and therefore we're going to see this reduced rate. So that's what we can see there. And it's all down to the fact that we've got this competition between oxygen and carbon dioxide for the Rubisco. If we go higher than that, up to about 45 degrees or higher, then the enzymes will be denatured. And thinking back to our earlier work on enzymes, by that what we mean is that those bonds that are holding that tertiary structure of our enzyme in that very specific shape to give us the specificity of the active site, they're going to be disrupted by the higher temperatures and therefore the active sites will no longer be complementary to our substrate. It is worth mentioning at this point 
that where we've been talking about specific temperatures in that little worked example there, that's true for a large number of plants, but not all, because the optimum temperature is going to actually vary between species. So there are going to be some species where we could find a higher optimum temperature, others where it's a lower optimum temperature. So that's very much a case of look at any information they're giving you in the question and make sure you apply it to the correct temperatures from that question. Don't just recall what we've done in this video and take it as gospel because every once in a while you'll be given some unfamiliar plant which has a different optimum temperature which will be presented to you in the question itself. Back to number two then is light intensity. Again, one we looked at at GCSE. When we're considering light intensity, there's two aspects to bear in mind. First one is that light is obviously providing the energy required for the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So obviously we need light in order to produce the ATP and reduced NADP, the end products of the light dependent stage. And that ATP and reduced NADP needs to go into the Calvin cycle in the light independent stage. So without light, we wouldn't create the ATP and the reduced NADP. We wouldn't then have those materials for the Calvin cycle. So greater light intensity leads to greater amounts of those products. The second aspect is to do with the stomata. Now the stomata are going to open when light is present. Greater the light intensity, the greater the amount of stomata that open. Why does this affect our photosynthesis? because we have gas exchange and transpiration happening through the stomata. So what we find is when the stomata are open, we get higher rates of gas exchange. Therefore, more carbon dioxide can enter our leaf and carbon dioxide is obviously necessary to combine with the RUBP in the light independent stage in order to obviously make our GP. If we look at the little graph on the left, we can see the general pattern. So initially, as we increase the light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis increases. Quite simply, higher light intensity, greater amount of energy for the light dependent stage. So more water is being split in our photolysis or photolysis. And therefore, we're going to generate greater quantities of ATP and reduced NADP. Those are then obviously going to filter into our light independent stage, and that means that we're going to be able to create more GP and in turn more TP. Eventually, though, we can see that this line actually plateaus, so kind of levels off. And the reason for this plateau is because there is a factor other than light intensity now affecting the rate of photosynthesis. So that could be temperature, could be carbon dioxide concentration. Think of a different factor, just not light intensity. What we're going to do now then is have a look at a different type of graph, which is showing us the relative concentrations of three important chemicals, GP, TP and RUBP. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a little line in here just to divide this up into two parts on the left we're going to have our bright light. And on the right, we're going to have dim light. So what we actually find is in bright light, then we have high levels of RUBP, high levels of TP, and low levels of GP. When we end up in a situation where the light levels fall, what we actually see is our GP cannot be reduced to TP. So because the GP can't be reduced to TP, GP levels are going to rise because it's not being reduced. So that means obviously it accumulates. TP levels are going to decrease because obviously we're not able to form our TP. So we get a drop there in that red line on this. Because we don't have the TP, that means we're not going to be able to regenerate our UBP. Therefore, we also get a decrease in the RUBP levels. So what we can see on that little graph then is just showing us the difference in those three important chemicals just as a result of changing light intensity. Our third factor to consider is carbon dioxide concentration. 
Now, carbon dioxide usually isn't going to be a limiting factor because normally what we find is in the atmosphere, in any aquatic habitats, we have plenty of carbon dioxide, so it's not really going to be that limiting factor. However, we are going to look and see what would actually happen should it be a limiting factor. Because of course there could be situations where it is a limiting factor if we're in some kind of a controlled condition, for example. So, first of all, carbon dioxide is obviously that raw material for carbon fixation. So if we've got less carbon dioxide, we're not going to be able to make as much TP for the simple fact that obviously we don't have the carbon dioxide to then combine with our RUBP. We're not going to therefore be able to make the GP and that will not be converted into TP. So lack of carbon dioxide means less TP being made. If we've got less TP being made, then what we also find is our need for the ATP and reduced NADP is going to decrease because they're part of obviously making that triose phosphate. So what we actually find here then is because we're not making as much TP, we don't need as much ATP or reduced NADP. So because of that, we then slow down the light dependent stage, which is the one that generates ATP and reduced NADP. This means that we're going to get a bit of an accumulation of ATP and NADP, and that's going to cause this thing called end product inhibition. And hopefully from our work back in module two, where we looked at enzymes and their inhibitors, we know what end product inhibition is. So basically what we see is the accumulation of the end products of a process are then basically going to prevent earlier stages of that from taking place. In terms of the type of graph that we see for our carbon dioxide concentration, it should be quite familiar to us. Initially, increasing rate increases the rate of photosynthesis, and then it will level off when something else is limiting it. What we're going to do then is just have a little look at this graph again with RUBP, GP and TP, but this time we're going to consider it in the context of carbon dioxide concentration. So we're going to put our little line in here and basically our dividing line there is going to be our 0.01% of carbon dioxide. So what do we find? Well, when the concentration of carbon dioxide falls below 0.01%, then we're going to find that our GP and TP levels will decrease. And we can see the black and the red lines there having that decline, but the RUBP is going to rise. Now, the reason for that, RUBP normally accepts carbon dioxide and then obviously becomes GP. GP becomes TP. If we've got a lack of carbon dioxide, quite clearly there's not enough to combine with the RUBP to form our GP. So because of that, RUBP levels are going to rise, the GP levels are going to fall, and if we have less GP, we can't make the TP. So TP also falls. The final factor we're going to talk about in terms of photosynthesis is water. Now, water is going to be critical to the functioning of a plant. And if we have a lack of water, we have a situation we refer to as water stress. Now, what this actually means then is we are going to be losing water in that process of transpiration, which hopefully we remember is the loss of water vapor from the aerial parts of the plant. So basically evaporation of water from places like the leaves. That water is going to keep being lost through transpiration, but if there's a lack of water in that particular environment, we're not going to be able to replace it by taking it up through the roots. So we've lost water, but we've not replaced water, and therefore the cells will become plasmalized. Now, plasmalized cells, not a good situation to be in, obviously. What we're going to find then is because we are starting to see this problem and plasmalized cells are bad news for our plant, then the roots are going to produce this chemical 
called abscisic acid. Now, the abscisic acid is going to then travel from the roots up to the leaves, and there it causes the stomata to close. The whole purpose behind doing this is to reduce the amount of water being lost in transpiration, because if we've closed the stomata, we've closed that exit point for our water molecules. However, in doing that, we've also reduced the amount of carbon dioxide that can enter because stomata are the entry point for carbon dioxide. So that then obviously has the knock on effect on the rate of our photosynthesis because we've limited the supply of carbon dioxide there. We will also see this wilting of our leaves because they've obviously lost a proportion of their water, then the tissue becomes flaccid. So the cells are plasmalized, but the tissue is flaccid. So don't mix up those two terms. You couldn't say that the tissues are plasmalized because plasmalizing is something that happens to a cell only, not a tissue. As always, I do recommend that you subscribe to the channel so you can see when I next upload a video and head on over to the A-Level Biology website where you can find a range of other resources to help you in your study of A-Level Biology.